Welcome. I'm Valerie Steele. Welcome to uh, the museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Program. Tonight we have my friend, author Michelle Gerber Klein, who has just written this wonderful book about Charles James. Hopefully the lights will dim enough so we won't feel that we're being interrogated here. Uh, Charles James is, of course, as you know, one of the most important and even really magical designers of the 20th century. Uh, he and this could have been as big as Dior, except he was his own worst enemy, as we'll talk about. Um, but despite his personal problems, he was tr truly a genius. So why don't I move ahead, if I can. Here we go. That oh, is this on? Yes, it is. So starting with this image, which is uh, one of Eleanor Lambert's publicity images mm -hmm. of him, can you just give me a little background, a little genealogy about Charlie's parents and uh, how they met and <laughs> his whole, their whole milieu. We'll start right, with that. So, right, so Charles came from a very famous uh, military background. His grandfather was one of the founders of Sandhurst and had tutored Winston Churchill uh, to get into military school. Winston Churchill was a notoriously bad student and had failed his entrance exams twice. So. Um, uh, Charles's father uh, taught at Sandhurst. He uh, was a captain in the army. Um, his mother was from Chicago. She was an heiress from Chicago. Uh, her, her family, her father had made his money in Great Lakes shipping and real estate, and they were probably the equivalent of billionaires today. They had underwritten the, the, the Chicago hospital. Uh, she was very beautiful and very talented in music. The, the, the society columns called her the tuneful Miss Brega because <laughs> she could sing opera. Uh -huh. um, they met, uh, at that time, it's sort of at the turn of the century, American, rich Americans went on a tour of Europe to meet uh, aristocratic husbands and uh, she met her husband on a tour uh, on a ship called the Empress of Japan. And they fell in love. They were both beautifully dressed and they fell in love with each other. They got married in Chicago. They had a huge society wedding at Christmas time and they moved back to Camberley where her parents bought them the biggest house in town, which is where Charles was born. Okay, now Charles comes on the scene and he's a creative child, but he's not his father's favorite. He's brilliant, he's mischievous, um, he's contrary, uh, his, he's probably effeminate. Um, he's certainly tiny and, and adorable, and he's the heir apparent to his mother's fortune, and you can, one can easily imagine that his father would not have liked him. I mean, he's not the son, kind of son he would want it, have wanted anyway, and he probably was jealous of, of how close his mother was to him. He was very talented. He was a child prodigy in music, so they had his, he and his mother had that in common. So he was sent off to some preparatory they were school? He, they, they immediately sent him off to boarding schools. Right, and he was expelled? No. He no. was not expelled. Um, he, he. Uh, I, there's no really record of the first boarding school in England, and then um, they went back to America for a period, and he went to a school in America which he hated, but he didn't get expelled. Mm -hmm. Then he went to Harrow in 1920, yes. He's, um, and he loved Harrow. He did very well at Harrow. And he actually made quite a lot of friends there. And he made a lot of friends, uh, inclu including Cecil Beaton, who was uh, his, uh, his sort of old, who was the older boy and his protector, mm -hmm. um, and friends who weren't at Harrow, like uh, Sir Francis Rose, and uh, who was a baronet and incredibly rich and very decadent, but really funny and actually a very good artist in the, in the Gertrude Stein circle, um, and Evelyn Waugh, who his father also didn't like because he wasn't, Evelyn Waugh's uh, father was Charles Dickens' literary agent, so he wasn't sort of up to the social standard of, of Mr. James. Well, it's very interesting, of course, because Evelyn Waugh was absolutely hateful to Cecil Beaton, and yet <laughs> Charles James was able to be friends with both of them. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, well, if we jump ahead for a minute, way ahead to 
a, a sketch which mm -hmm. you might want to just comment on briefly before we go back to um, this. This is how I met Charles. When, when I was first starting out in fashion, I used to hang out at Henry Bendel's. Um, and I hung out there so much that Jeannie Rosenberg, who merchandised the second floor, occasionally asked me what I thought of things. And one day, <laughs> she, well, you know, I was like the young yeah. kid who loved clothes. And, and one day she arrived with, with this plastic box and she looked a bit nervous about it and she showed it to me and inside it was um, a see-through blouse and she sort of said to me, well, would you wear this? And I can't really wear see-through blouses, so I said, no, I wouldn't. And she, she said, great, we'll tell them it's too special, we don't have to buy it then. Well, it was this blouse and this blouse is a very famous blouse, not only because it's the last one of the last things he ever designed, but because it's an iteration of a blouse that he made for Clive Bell's mistress, um, and uh, it was sketched by Matisse. So you were in the 1930s. You were responsible for one of his last rejections. From yes, a unwittingly, <laughs> I felt terrible about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next picture will show him very young, and really rather beautiful. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about the beginning of his career, how he went from Harrow to making hats, which was his first step before making dresses. Okay, okay, I just want to point out something. This is also a, a Cecil Beaton photograph. Um, and he's wearing a bathing suit. And as you can see, there's a little button here, it's button, but he, <laughs> He has his hair, uh, he has brilliantine in his hair. So, I mean, you don't really go swimming with brilliantine in your hair. It's all yeah. sticky. So, it's clearly a posed photograph. Indeed. Um, this was um, when he first came to England and, and started his, his career making clothes. Before that, his father took him out of Harrow. They sent him to uh, music school in Bordeaux, which he couldn't finish because Allegedly, his father had had him raped. His father didn't like, like it that he was running around Harrow wearing makeup and, and playing Puck in Midsummer Night's Dream, and he didn't like his fancy friends. So his father allegedly had him raped, and so he really couldn't finish his music studies. Um, they sent him to study um, art and painting in Scotland, and he couldn't really wrap his head around that either. Uh, so they got him a job with Samuel Insull, who owned Con Edison in the United States, and who was a close family friend. In Chicago. In Chicago, right. And, um, and Samuel Insull was going to take him under his arm and, and push him up the ranks of the company, and Charles didn't want to do that. And instead, he made back teaks in his bathtub and staged a fashion show and got demoted to the architecture department, which he loved. And then when his father came on board and started working with Insul too, Charles left, because mm -hmm. he didn't want to be in the same company with his father, and started making hats in a friend of his basement. Okay, I'm gonna to cut to the next um, picture, and you can continue. So, oh, this is Harrow. So yes. this is, yeah, so this is the first photograph that, that Cecil took of Charles, and there he is, Puck, Midsummer Night Dream, showing off his legs. He was very, he wrote really nice legs, and he was really proud of them. Um, and he's holding his performance flowers, and all the boys in the row back, I don't know if you can see it in this, are sort of kicking up their legs, too. It's, it's, it's a really charming, uh, Photograph. He also uh, composed music at Harrow. This was before he had the problem with his father. Um, and he wrote poetry and he illustrated a book of poems. So he did well there as long as he stayed. And when he started doing hats, mm -hmm. would he, I suppose he chose hats because it was something you could do in a small space and was very fanciful part of fashion? Yeah, and he had a friend in England who was the illegitimate son of, of a duke who had made quite a splash in society doing this, mm -hmm. and it showed him how it was done. So it was a way to be social and have fun and make some money and do something that he wanted to do that wasn't, and not be under his father's thumb. And what he did was he molded the hats on people's head. He was sort of like a hat hairdresser, and he cut the shape of the head so it was really becoming to the person who wore them. So they were custom hats. And actually, the people in Chicago loved it. I mean, not only because everybody knew him because he was his mother's son, but because it was sort of a cool thing to do. They, they may not have been the best hats ever, but they were cool. Well, it's interesting when you think how Chanel started as a milliner and Bill mm -hmm. Cunningham started as a milliner. And it does seem to be something that 
a lot of people have been able to start Did their do. fashion careers yes. with Halston. Mm -hmm. um, when he started making hats, uh, Charles's father uh, disinherited him. Um, and uh, there was an incident with a sort of, uh, uh, there was an incident with, with sort of a stage suicide. We're not sure whether it was serious or, or deliberately dramatic. But he ended up uh, in the hospital that his grandfather had paid for, and it caused quite a stir in Chicago. And Fowler McCormick, who was another family friend and who owned International Harvester, gave him $25 to get out of town. So he went back to London <laughs> or to New York first. Right. So he, he piled his stuff in his Pierce Arrow Roadster and drove to Manhattan and started peddling his hats up and down the beach. Um, and then his sister, in 1929, got married to Gordon Anthony, yeah. who was the, who is uh, Ninette de Valois' brother, okay. and was the uh, photographer of note of, of ballet. So it was sort of ballet royalty wedding, yes. and Charles got to design the clothes. And give away the bride, yes. even though his father was there. So he moved to England and he started making clothes there. Um, and this is an example of one of the first dresses uh, he made. He is, he started. It, it was the, the end of the twenties, and so he he was tired of of the loose flapper-like clothes. So he started experimenting with wrapping. And so you're you're meant to be able to play with a shawl any number of ways. He made it for. Uh, Lady Lucia Warner, who was one of his favorite clients in 1937, and Antonio Lopez sketched it like this in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, the person who's wearing that dress is a young boy that they went out and discovered on the street because he was the only one who could fit into it yeah. gracefully. Yes, that's famously, he yeah. sketched them <laughs> on young slim boys in the 70s. Yeah. Now, how did he get to meet Scaparelli then? Um, his, for, he was terribly underfinanced in London, and uh, so he went bankrupt. And, and he, he had a series, this was the first in a long series of Charles James bankruptcies, because he was never yes. properly financed. So he just got money, went through it, went bankrupt, got money, went through it. Anyway, he was introduced by Cecil to Elsa Scaparelli on the occasion of his first bankruptcy. Um, she helped him pack up his stuff um, so the bailiff, so the, the police wouldn't get it. Um, and then they all went out to tea. And they became yes. friends. And he followed her, or, or he went with her to Paris, mm -hmm. uh, where he taught himself uh, to, be, to make clothes in, in the tradition of the couture and worked with her um, and for her. She paid him, she wore clothes that he made for her. So did Chanel, incidentally. So it was a huge compliment. Mm -hmm. um, and here she is photographed by Cecil Beaton. Um, and the story about this photograph in her, her biography, The Shocking Life, is that <laughs> Cecil took sh so many shots and took so long doing it that she was getting completely nuts. And the thoughts must have influenced the chandelier because it came crashing down. <laughs> so he, he got so scared, he took a perfect one in the next second. Oh. <laughs> um, is there, do you want to know anything more about Scaparelli and Charles were, were very involved with a surrealist yes. painter. She, she had a whole group of friends, and including Jean Cocteau and Salvador Dali, who decorated her clothes. Yes. And Charles worked in conjunction with them as well, although he didn't really make decorated clothes, but he used their shapes. Mm. Uh, and, and in their clothes, and he made clothes sort of in conversation with art that they made and, and fashion that they made with Scaparelli. Yeah, and of course Scaparelli was someone who really believed that fashion was an art. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which I'm sure influenced his opinion, in a sense, of that. Yeah, I think they, they, were, they, were, they respected each other. They were sort of collaborators. They worked together on certain things. They both dressed Millicent Rogers when she was in her Tyrolean period. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is another experiment in wrapping, uh, which he invented in 1929 and then later per perfected in England in the 1930s, and it's the first wrap dress. Um, it's called the taxi dress because he had a fantasy. <laughs> when he got to New York, he was, he was in a taxi and he thought, gee, wouldn't it be nice to have a dress you could just unwrap, make love, and wrap up. <laughs>
<laughs> so that, right, an taxi. easy free dress. So that's the first wrap dress. The, the fasteners on the side are Bakelite, which is the first version of plastic. Oh, that's kind of marvelous. Yeah, I am great. And this dress? Um, that's an experiment with draping. Uh, and uh, so he, what he did here, he, he took the center of, it's also from, from the late 30s, he, and it's also an Antonio sketch in the 70s, so, so it sort of shows the, how the, the, and it was also, how do you say that, Giacomo, Giacomo, Giacomus? Giacomus. Tell, explain who Giacomus is, because I... Young, he's, a, he's a young French designer from south of France who's very, very trendy right now. He must be about 27 years old. Right, and so in his spring collection, this dress was featured. So it's an example of how sort of timeless. But what, what Charles did was he took up the center of the skirt and sort of tucked it here and made these two huge pockets that emphasize the hips and sway yes. when you move. Well, it's interesting, too, when you look at some of the early dresses, which sometimes then were redone in the mm -hmm. 70s, how fluid they are. And so they're different beautiful. from the constructed dresses of the 50s. No, 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 they're, they're incredibly beautiful. And then they move, they're not, they're not lined at all, and, but he cuts them so well that they look as though they're dancing. And now this, of course, is really my favorite, I think, of all of his creations. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell it, them about this. One doesn't of his most it look famous. as though she's sort of, she looks sort of like a turtle almost, <laughs> in the big pop. Um, so, uh, Scaparelli liked to name her, her collections. Uh, she sort of themed collections, and I guess it was in 1939 she did a circus collection. It yes. was just before the war. And Salvador Dali did the specter of death at the circus, and he did a dress with a quilted skeleton coming all yes. the way down the front. Yes. So that was quilting as death. So Charles thought, well, I'll do quilting as sex. <laughs> and, and he took a bed jacket, and he, which is quilted, and, and he turned it into an evening jacket that one could wear outdoors. And he loved, he personally used to wear it. He and, and, and Sir Francis Rose used to go around in the south of France gambling and Charles would wear that to sort of shock people. Yes, well I mean it's such a wonderful, wonderful garment. And then mm -hmm. of course the clothes that he was making for his friends down there, all those clingy, soft, sort of creamy right, pajamas yes, that yes, all the boys yeah. were running for around Stephen in. Tennant, yeah. Exactly, the, for Stephen Tennant, yeah. Exactly, for Stephen The pants that just showed every ripple and yes. fissure, yes. Yes. Um, so this is really the first puffer. Yep. Uh, it is. It's kind of an yeah. amazing piece. The V&A owns it. Yeah. It's, yeah, it is at the V&A. Um, when he, so in the 30s, Charles goes back and forth between London and, and Paris, and he meets Anne Messel, yes. who later became Anne Armstrong Jones, and then after that married um, uh, the Earl of Ross, so she was Anne Countess of Ross. Um, Anne came from, Anne is actually my favorite of his clients. Uh, she came from a, a wealthy German-Jewish banking family. She had a wonderful childhood. She traveled. Her, her country house had 600 acres full of gardens. It's called Nyman's. Um, she, she never really went to school. She had private tutors. She had a, a woman who, who taught, him, taught her to pull the wool off the fences when the sheep, uh, the sheep jumped over it and card it and, we, and, and kind of turn it into cloth. Um, she was taught how to make lace, she was taught how to sew, she was taught how to speak languages and sing and dance. Uh, she was never taught any mathematics, but what she could do, she did very, very well. Um, when um, Diaghilev was in town, and that's her brother, Oliver, who was the go-to designer in, for, for the stage in London in the yes. 30s, and who invented white on white. And if you, any of you have seen My Fair Lady, the, the movie, that white and white Cecil Beaton scene came directly from Oliver Messel. Um, so 
she was very close to Oliver. They spent a lot of time together. Uh, they'd make things together. They'd go to the V&A together. They'd, they, he'd play hooky so he could pretend, pretend he was sick so they could stay in bed together and make little miniature houses. Um, and later they liked going to fancy dress balls together. So there they are. He's kneeling at her feet. They adored each other. And she's, you know, she's sort of the penultimate princess in the fairy tales. She grew up reading fairy tales too. And, and her whole sense of fashion was very fairy tale like. She's the woman who um, Charles started making the big skirts for and with. Yes. And so she's really the woman who inspired the beginnings of the new look. And that's the last um, oh. dress he made for her. There she is with her children. So she's there with Anthony Armstrong Jones, who was later the Earl of Snowden, um, and her daughter. And the little adorable boy there is, is the current Earl of Ross. And, and this is one of the only dresses that Charles made that has a print on it. It's also 19, I think it's 1939. That's when yes. Snow White came out. Yep. And so that's, she was a fairy tale come true and this is her princess dress and it has, it has little Disney pictures of Snow White all over it. This is such, again, such an extraordinary and unique dress. It's in a collection in England. Yeah, it's really beautiful. It's in her collection, I think, in England. Which, yes, went, but went to Brighton, right. I think and, Brighton. And uh -huh. which we discussed, she considered, she considered her clothing collection to be an autobiography. Yes, and it's a wonderful collection. They did a show down there of her, her clothes. Um, in 1939, everybody left Paris because the war was about to break out. Um, and they came to America because <laughs> they didn't want to be in Paris when the Germans invaded. Uh, Charles left with them, and he ran into Elizabeth Arden, who was born so poor that there's no birth record of her. Or there's no record of her right. birth. Um, she, she was named Florence Nightingale, and she changed her name to Elizabeth Arden after uh, a Tennyson poem. <laughs> oh, heavens. Uh, and she's a woman, really, who invented w cosmetics. She's the first woman to have imported mascara into the United States. She got the idea from the hookers in Paris at the, at the beginning of the First World War. Um, th that's another Cecil Beaton photograph of her. She hated it. She was very self-conscious about how she looked. I don't think she was very pretty. She looks quite glamorous there to me, but she tore it up and threw it at Cecil, and he said, well, you'll still have to pay me for it. Mm -hmm. um, she hired Charles to yes. uh, make her haute couture because her rival, Hattie Carnegie, who had been selling dresses had decided to get into the cosmetic business. Yeah. And the reason she chose Charles was that he had made her trousseau uh, for Ivan Ivalnov, who was a fake prince. So the wedding didn't last, but the trousseau really worked well. And he'd yeah. made the Countess of Ross's trousseau when she married the Earl of Ross. So it was very prestigious. Yes. And he yes. was very prestigious. He was the most prestigious designer, so she wanted him. Um, it lasted two years. It was, uh, and, not, and his severance was $6,000, but he met most of his major American clients there. Um, this is another, uh, Charles moved backwards and forwards in his designs. Every, he was very sexually, very interested in sex. And, and he viewed, he, and he thought of clothing as it was linked to sexuality. And so every dress in a way is solving a problem of how you can express sexuality and sex appeal through clothing. Yes. Oh, it's clear how he did it there. This was also the dress he used in the Modest ad, which is yes. an idea of how that, why that ad was so, so successful. But he, he did the first iteration of it in the 30s. Um, and, and then it, uh, Arden used it in one of her shows in 1945. And then Lopez sketched it yes. again in the 70s. Yeah. Now, this is one of my favorite of his clients, okay, so of course. So you talk a little no, bit. No, no, this, getting... this is your book, but <laughs> Millicent Rogers, such a, an amazing, amazing style, yeah. character, icon. She was a wonderful. Millicent was, Millicent's father, grandfather was known as the hellhound of Wall Street. He, <laughs> um, he and JFK started um, uh, their oil business together. 
Um, her father was really domineering. Uh, her mother came from a really interesting family and had been a very good friend of Mark Twain's. In fact, there's a book of love letters that she and Mark Twain wrote to each other when she was 17 and he was 70. It's called Letters to Mary or something. It was a bestseller in the day. Um, Millicent was born really beautiful, uh, but she, had, she got really sick when she was young. And they didn't think that she would live to be 10. Oh, she lived to be 51, as it turned out. But, but she always had a heart problem, which accounts for her doing exactly what she wanted to do when she felt like doing it. She figured she might die at any moment, so she might as well do what she wanted to do now. Um, it, because she was so sickly when she was little and had to spend so much time in bed, her mother really educated her very well. So she could speak Latin fluently. It was a lot. It was her secret language with her little brother. She could translate Schiller from German. She spoke French on a daily basis. And she started, sort of like Frida Kahlo, mm -hmm. you know what, uh, turning herself into a work yes. of art. And um, Scaparelli said of her, if she hadn't been so terribly rich, she would have been a really great artist. Certainly she was a style icon from the 1930s through the 1950s when she died. Yeah. She also invented, with Charles, uh, the Santa Fe look or the Southwestern uh, look. That was the last thing she did when she lived in Taos. So um, um, among the outfits that he designed for her, mm -hmm. What were the range of them? Because there are a number which are, were in the Brooklyn collection, which have now gone to the Met. And then there are also the ones that he did in Taos, which was sort of inspired by her idea of kind of a... If Indian we go to wear. the next slide, I'll, yeah. I'll show one of the dresses that he, he made for her. Um, so, so this is, it, it's called Homage to Giorgio O'Keefe. And, and you can see sort of the what Harold calls the labial front draping. She wore it in, in flesh cover, colored five with this sort of pink thing coming down here. Um, so, so that's one of the dresses. She, they were very, what, what you say in French, sans gêne. You know, they did whatever they wanted. It's very demure and it's incredibly sexy at the same time. Um, a, a lot of the dresses in, in, in his first, he had his first uh, fashion in, in 1947 when the new look came out and the new look swept the world. Uh, Christian Dior gave Charles credit as the inspiration for the new look. So Charles was the insiders, the designer's designer. If you were super cool, you went to Charles James. Um, and he did a retrospective. He was the first fashion designer to have a retrospective in a museum. He, he sort of took fashion and made you look at it in a different way. And he had a retrospective at, at the Brooklyn Museum called A Decade of Design. And those were the dresses he had designed for Millicent over a period of 10 years. And when did he do that? Hmm? When 47, did he do 47, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, in 1950, after the, the sort of triumph of the decade of design, and just when he got his first Cody Award for, for construction and color, uh, the Domineals asked him to uh, do the interior of their house in Houston. Um, Dominique Domineal was the, another oil heiress. <laughs> uh, her father had invented the, the instrument uh, that everybody still uses today. Uh, it's, uh, it's, if, you, if you drill for oil, it's still called doing a schlumberger. <laughs> um, it, it's the instrument that you, you put in the ground to see if there's actually oil there. And they had the patent on it, and so they were incredibly wealthy. And she was also extremely well educated. She had a degree in math from the Sorbonne. Um, and she had worked with Marlena Dietrich on the Blue Angel behind the scenes. So she was, um, they moved to, she and her husband John, he was Jean, but she, he changed his name to John, uh, moved to Houston uh, to avoid the war. And uh, they started collecting art. Uh, They're first with Robert Couturier and then with, um, Oh uh, God, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. Do you do you remember? remember the name do you remember the other? Advisor, um, no. But of course, they're they Alexander Iolas, who was a Greek who had danced in um, uh, De Cuevas's ballet, okay. 
And then de Cuevas kicked him out, and he, and he started dealing art. Elizabeth Arden underwrote the art gallery. And that's how uh, Dominique uh, met Charles, because she went to that art gallery. But their house was very, very modernist. It was designed they, by which Philip, architect? Well, they got, yeah, yes. they, 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 they hired Philip Johnson. It was just at the, he was just starting out. He was just designing the glass house, and they hired him to design their house. It was his first residence, really, because the glass house is sort of a showpiece. It was very angular, and they decided they wanted something um, more voluptuous. So they hired Charles to make it voluptuous. Which and Philip he Johnson did. hated. <laughs> I mean, he absolutely hated. It destroyed his design. Philip was Philip was really upset. I mean, he could not believe that they hired a dress designer to design to do the interior of his house. <laughs> he wrote them a letter saying, you know, this is this is not very nice. He's a very good dress designer, but he's a dress designer. <laughs> I'm some, the architect. Some of the interior pieces, though, are quite fabulous. I mean, they are sort of surreal well, and he, voluptuous. They are, well, he, the, so he made all this furniture that followed the curves of a woman's body. He said, so this is sort of be, be the curves of a woman's body if she's lying down in wet cement, you know. Um, he, <laughs> made, he made, he made an, a, another sofa that, that's sort of like the Salvador Dali yes, lips. The lips. Um, he, he, brought, he brought these Japanese colors. He, he really liked, you know, he hired Japanese to work in his atelier because they worked so precisely. He, he really appreciated the Japanese aesthetic and, and he brought all these Japanese colors to paint the interior of, yes. of the Manila house as well as bolts of silk and felt and velvet. He lined the house the way you would line the inside of a dress. Um, it, it was really extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, and then they filled it, and, and it really made, so when you walk into the Dominion house, it's, it's a big glass entrance, and the house is in sort of a jungle. So it's, it's like this square box, and sort of with this jungle outside, and there's a big glass entrance. And Charles found this incredibly curvy Rococo sofa um, that, that was made by a violin maker called Beltner, and he covered it in green, and he put it inside the box of the house. Mm. So, so there's this tension between the inside, the box, and the outside. Yes. And it's really beautiful, and it also is very kind of something that a surrealist It's very do. surreal, yes, yeah. it's marvelous. Um, so he did that. He forced the Dominiels, who didn't play piano, if you want to look at the next slide, to buy a grand piano, because of course there are the curves there, and that adds, adds the element of music and sound. To, to his creation. There's Dominique again. Uh, I mean, and, and she was in many ways, though, very austere and kind of religious, and yet, the cl and she would wear the clothes for years, but he, he did some quite fabulous clothes for her. But she didn't, so she wasn't like Millicent. No, like he like and Millicent, Millicent were, would argue over, you know, how big the lapel would be, and she was very hands on, and, and you know, she'd tell him what to do. Dominique just collected them as right. sort of objet de collection. Yes. Uh, but she understood them, and, and no, she completely didn't care about clothes. In right. fact, um, uh, Christophe told me she liked to wear old ones because it gave her the feeling that she was saving her money to buy art. You know, yes. she'd show up with mismatched <laughs> shoes, you know, because she was absent-minded. No, but she, she loved, she collected everything. She collected the drawings, she collected the advertisements, she collected the clothes, she mm -hmm. collected the furniture. Uh -huh. They have a wonderful collection there. Yeah, it's a fabulous collection. Austin Hurst, yes. who is responsible for underwriting his 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 most famous yes. and favorite design, uh, the abstraction. Austin um, came from Virginia. She was a Southern belle. Um, her father was also in the military. Uh, she loved dressing up when she was a little girl, and she was encouraged to do so. Uh, she met her first husband, Igor Cassini, was, and he came down and he was writing a column and some guys in, 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 in her town didn't like the column he was writing and sort of lynched him and she protected him. <laughs> she protected him and stood up for him. And so they got married and she uh, became a journalist. And she was under the, her mentor was Peg Zwecker who owned the Washington Post mm. and was incredibly a uh, powerful woman. And, and so Austin worked for her. Uh, and then when her husband got the Charlie Knickerbocker column and moved to New York, she didn't want, she got his column and, and she didn't want to move. Yeah. She wanted to stay. And they sort of drifted apart. And then she met um, 
William Randolph II, yeah. <laughs> uh, and they fell in love, and so she, she married the boss, so to speak, but she was a, an ace uh, reporter. She blew the whistle on Alger Hiss. She was serious. Well, how, how though did she and Charles James create the four-leaf clover ball gown, the abstract ball gown? He really made it, so in, in 1953, when, when we'd won the war with the help of England, and, 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 and rationing was over, right? He, he made the dress as an homage to, uh, to uh, uh, the, the Eisenhower inauguration. He originally made it for Pat Nixon, and Pat Nixon was a Quaker, and it was too lavish for her, so she turned it down. Um, and so Austin said, that's okay. She understood eight-foot skirts. <laughs> and she said, that's okay. I'll underwrite it for you. Yeah. And she did. And it's really a compodium. I mean, you can talk about the six, the, however many pattern pieces yes. there. I mean, I don't, that's not right. But it is a compodium of, of, his, of his favorite things that he liked to do in clothing. The rough with the smooth, which is mm -hmm. very melodic. So, so it has, you know, velvet and file, so that works. The, the skirt that moves, that lilts when yes. you walk and is designed to, to look at once sexy and beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, the elevated bust line, which he loved playing around with and which Austin also bought him uh, um, en pure dresses, dialectual dresses, so he could fool around with that and yes. see how they had been made. Um, and, and so it, it, he called it abstraction because it combines and abstracts everything, many of the problems he had been working on, and also as an homage to um, the art of that period. Yes. I mean, well, of course, Dior said that Charles James was the, the, the designer who most approached the status of art with his, well, it wasn't, it was Balenciaga who said that. But I think, don't you think he was real, really an artist? I mean, he approached clothing as though he was making an artwork. Yes. But even for designers who were reluctant to think of fashion as being art, they put Charles separately. Like, if it's going to be art, then he's the artist. What he's doing is art. It's true. I mean, Philip, G Philip Julian, who's this odd character who, who wrote. Oh, God, yes. He's wonderful. That I know. weird <laughs> French art writer, a novelist. <laughs> yeah, right. But, and who lived in England. But, so he wrote a book called The Dictionnaire de Snobbies. And, and he said, at the top, there was Charles James, who made one dress a year. After that came Dior, who made four. <laughs> then were all the rest. <laughs> 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 Perfect. Yeah. Um, so now we're out of sequence. Now yeah. we're out of sequence. We, now we go on towards. Do you want to skip this, or, or do you want to do this? This is uh, oh, this is actually this. a famous pho photograph by by Cecil, and it was published in Vogue in, in 1936 on both sides of the Atlantic, which Charles was very happy about because it made him transatlantic for the first time. He was a kid. I mean, he mm -hmm. was he wasn't 30 when this happened. Yeah. Not even. Um, uh, and he started experimenting with, 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 with capes. Uh, and these capes are made uh, out of um, ribbons from a, a, a manufacturer of military ribbons called Concolombard. Mm -hmm. uh, and he discovered a, a bunch of them when he was with Poiret in the flea market. And, and he made various versions. He made this, and, and so did Scaparelli. Scaparelli mm -hmm. also worked with Coco Humbert, but what she made with Coco Humbert was she made this print that, that, that was clippings of all her press clippings that yes, she stuck together right. and she had him print it, right? And Charles made these. So it, they're different approaches to working with yes. the same thing. Um, so this is done, it, it's supposed to be a surrealist photograph, um, and, it, and it's supposed to, uh, remind you of Salvador Dali's long shadows, mm. Mm. and the background is by uh, Christian Berard, Baby Berard, who 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 did all the who was sort of the creative director for Beauty and the Beast, yes. which was Cocteau's surrealist film, um, and it it it's sort of uh, I don't know. Tell you talk to me. What what does it say to you? Well, it it's seems called, to, it's, a, it's a classic kind of surrealist fashion image from that period. Yeah. It, it's extraordinary how that, that captivated the, the fashion photographers and illustrators. The magazines were full of it for several years. It's interesting how, how fashion was very closely aligned to art at, at, at that point in time. There's, there's, a, there, there's a companion set of photographs of Scaparelli, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, designs with, with, the, the with the drawers, drawers coming, out, coming the out, right. <laughs> Um, so, 
I'm, so they, yeah, they, they put in the, your, your color so pictures I'm gonna in do, the middle. Do you want me to do the Cecil Beaton? So, do, so this is this is Cecil you. Beaton's sketch of the Elizabeth Arden uh, showroom, uh, which actually was published in Vogue just after Charles and Elizabeth split up. Mm -hmm. uh, but on it is one of Charles's most famous um, dresses called uh, the Sirene or Mermaid dress. Yes. It's also called the Lobster dress because it was. He again did it in conversation with Salvador yes. Dali, who painted that lobster down yes. the front of the white dress. Um, so here, Charles, so there Salvador Dali paints this sort of phallic sea creature all the way down mm -hmm. the front of the dress. Charles makes the woman into a mermaid. And, yes. and if you see that that little stitching, it's like the backbone of the mm -hmm. tail, and then the tail fans out at the bottom. Yeah. So she becomes the deadly siren. Yes. It's right. a fabulous dress. It's, yeah, it, it, really beautiful. I think just right, right. It, it's just a perfect dress. Oh, wait, I can't, I want to go back first because I want you to just say a little bit about uh, So, the yeah, the Robert Polidori. Yes. Well, that's from the, that's from the Menil uh, uh, stockpile in, in their archives. Uh, so, uh, it's a René Magritte painting, and you see how René Magritte is juxtaposing things that don't really go together. And then next to it is, is this little red coat that, that Charles made. And it, it's, it's a combination of an opera cape uh, that he made. He made children's clothes yes. at one point, And he used the opera cape when he made the children's clothes. But the arms come from little um, elbow pipes that he and Dominique discovered in a gutter when they were walking. So he put elbow pipes on an opera cape. Okay, and I think, Valerie, you're really better to talk about this than I am. Oh, this sorry. actually, this photograph, which was incredibly difficult to get for the book because it's, it's a rare and famous photograph by Louise Dahl Wolf. Part of it is in the possession of FIT and part of it is in, in the possession of the Society of Defense for for a photographer or something like, who, are, who are a nightmare to, to work with. The Center but. for Creative Photography owns the copyright for these. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's, one, it's complicated. You mm -hmm. have to get double permissions. Yeah, right, right, yes. But talk, talk a little bit about Louise Dahl Wolf. Well, Louise, Louise Dahl Wolf was so interesting because she was an American photographer and a woman photographer who was so different than the European men. And her, she worked in color. She worked much more with um, motion, even though in these cases they are frozen in the pose, and yet they're sort of they're dancing. Though they're as, exactly that's Charles's favorite photograph ever of his clothes. They're quite fabulous, and she was very sort of down to earth person, and worked a lot with Freeland on mm -hmm. a lot of of work for Harper's Bazaar for years and was really an important, important figure because men were dominating fashion photography even as women were dominating editorial work. And right. she was one of the first to break into the fashion photography. And she does exquisite photographs. What's interesting also in this photograph to me is that you can't really tell, well you can tell, but, but there's sort of the suspicion that the women might be looking at each other when in fact they're looking at themselves in the mirror. Well the mirror is such a magical image, yeah. the idea of going through the mirror and, and admiring mm -hmm. yourself in the mirror. It's a very powerful metaphor. Yeah. It works on all kinds of levels. Yeah. Um, the dress on one of the ways one of the m m ways that Charles invented to make money for himself was he'd go to clothing ma to, fa to fabric manufacturers and say, "Give me your new fabric and I'll make it into something special and elegant, yes. and everybody will want to use it." Um, so uh, the first poof dress, uh, which he made first in blue velvet for Austin when he was experimenting with the elevated yes. bust line, this he made uh, for. Um, uh, the American Rayon Institute to show off uh, how elegant rayon could be. Yes. And that is, that Vogue, that's from a series that Vogue commissioned in 1948 uh, to, to sort of be at the same time as, as the Brooklyn Museum, Museum show. And of course in that movie that came out, Phantom Thread, they posed uh, the actor to look like this sitting oh, on Oh, completely, the yeah. The act, that story has nothing to do with Charles James, yeah. except they made, the act, they made him look exactly like Charles, yes. as much like Charles James as they could, yeah. Exactly. 
Uh, this is another cape. Um, this is a famous horse pee horse photograph. And here, this is again another experiment with surrealism. The, 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 Charles liked to, to sort of do things so they would, they would echo other things and you would think of something else where you, when you were looking at them, but you weren't quite sure what it was, what you were thinking about, but it would affect you emotionally. I think that was his game plan. Um, so here I think, so here he's juxtaposed the colors and, and the woman, is, it looks almost as though she's sitting on a twig mm. and she kind of looks like a bird of prey almost with a little thing coming yes, out. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and so it's, uh, you, you think about, well, you know, is, is this protecting her? Is it showing her off? Well, a lot of his clients must have felt that they were being victimized by him when they would order dresses, you know, a year in advance for an important event and then it wouldn't appear or he would have sold it to someone else in the meantime. Or, I mean, he was kind of notoriously difficult to work with. Um. Mm. <laughs> Austin Hurst compared him to Leonardo da Vinci because the Mona Lisa ended up in the Louvre and never got to the person who commissioned Ah, there you have it, exactly. <laughs> um, his nemesis, Eleanor Lambert, who invented fashion as we still know it, right? Um, when she was very young, again, this is a Cecil Beaton photograph that actually belongs to the family. It belongs to Moses, her grandson. Um, this is when she first started out in the 1930s. And she was really pretty. She, was, she came from Cross Crawfordsville, Indiana. Um, and she was one of the most spunky people, I think, in the history of the United States. She just went out and got things done. That is true. Now, you've got to explain, though, to the audience. How did she become his nemesis? Because this is kind of well, a typical tragic Charles James story. Well, it's the she. Um, so Eleanor, Eleanor invented first. She invented art publicity, and she was the publicity director for the Whitney. Um, she was involved in the founding of MoMA. Uh, she. It was the Costume Institute. The Met was her idea. So was the Party of the Year. Um, as she invented the Cody Award. And uh, she, her husband, uh, Bernard Berkson, was the publisher of the Journal American, which was a pretty well-known newspaper at that time. I mean, lots of people read it. And she was a publicist, so she, she would write about her, her, her uh, fashion clients, and uh, he would publish what she wrote. I mean, they were like a power couple. And she was everybody's publicist. You didn't, whether you paid her or not, she was, she was your publicist and she would introduce people to each other and she would network and she was very motherly. I mean, and lots of people loved her and she was, she was incredibly good to, to many people and, and had a Rolodex that just didn't stop, obviously. Um, and when Charles was thinking on capitalizing on his prestige, and, and going into and expanding his, his business into sort of a, a more mass marketing um, approach, she introduced him to a number of people, including this guy called Samuel Winston, who was a Seventh Avenue Garmento. And obviously Charles was very lofty and the two of them did not, were not destined to get along. But Charles did use all his connections and his savoir faire to put Samuel Winston in the dress business. It was incredibly successful, fast. Samuel Winston then created a pair, and, and it was a, a, a licensing deal. So Charles supplied, Charles got an advance, Charles supplied designs, he got royalties on the designs he supplied. Uh, Winston created a parallel company that made the same designs, but he didn't have to pay Charles anything for them. Uh, well, so when Charles, this was 1954, Charles was getting married, he found out about this, and he didn't really was not, he just stopped designing. And Winston sued him. And it was really, Charles was at the pretty incredibly prestigious, and this lawsuit was really embarrassing. It was all over Women's Wear Daily. It made him sound as he was a total crook, when not, you know, there, there were two sides to the story. Um, and Charles had to sue back. Eleanor smelled disaster and got Winston to withdraw the suit, but for the first time in his life, Charles's father was backing him up, and I think it must have been really heady, and Charles wouldn't stop, uh, but he couldn't really articulate what was wrong, 
And so he got some money, but he lost the copyright to the designs that had taken him so long to perfect. So it was a disaster for him. Um, and it used up a lot of money. Uh, it used up most of his wife's fortune uh, because it was the beginning of then of a series of litigations with various people and, and dissolving of agreements. And um, it was it was it was a turn in the wind for for uh, after that he gave up mass marketing except he had one he had one agreement with a guy called Samuel Robert that that went on for a while and they really got along but. But, uh, well, and then later he had the abortive relationship with Halston. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, <laughs> we, we'll get to that. <laughs> but um, one of the, one of the um, a Cody, the second Cody Award Charles received was for his coats. And uh, so this is why these coats are with Eleanor Lambert, and so this is one of them. The coats were many, of, he invented the cocoon coat, among other things, and the cocoon coat obvi is obvious. When you take it off, you emerge like a butterfly, and it protects you the like a The cocoon. coats are marvelous. The I mean, coats the ball are wonderful, gowns are right, the yeah. most famous. So there's the this one, and then there's another one that, that you can see that's really beautiful, with a really great collar, right? Okay. Um, this is Nancy, Charles's wife, and his last muse. Um, uh, Nancy comes from Kansas City, and so she's Midwestern like his mother, an heiress like his mother. They look very much alike. Um, she has a, a, a very different, uh, up until Nancy, he modeled all his designs on Millicent Rogers' body, which is sort of you know, a classic violin. And Nancy was sort of Lucas Cranach. She had a small, high breasts. A uh, big, big tummy, <laughs> narrow hips, mm -hmm. um, and he changed uh, his way of, of of making clothes for her. But here she is. They just got married. Uh, she's in the swan dress. She's pregnant. She's with his urn. That's his yes. his symbol. And and the uh, curtains in the background, which I think are absolutely beautiful, are an interfacing called Pelon because the Pelon company had hired him to do something with their fabric. He made these curtains with them. Um, oh, the tree dress. This Marietta is one of tree. his last designs that he made for Marietta Tree. And it's also an experiment in movement. He was very proud of the flounce because it moved so fluidly. And he was also very proud of this dress because it looked as though you could not move in it. Mm. But in fact, you could move very yes. easily. You could basically dance the tango in it yes. if you wanted to. That's a fabulous design. Um, this is Charles. So after the incident with Samuel Winston right. and, and when he, he and his wife got divorced and he really, it's not that he was impoverished because he never really had any money, but, he, but his, his business schemes were obviously not gonna work out. So uh, he was given three rooms in the Chelsea Hotel. He was the only non-artist to receive free rooms in the Chelsea Hotel and he moved into the Chelsea Hotel with his entourage um, and a beagle called Sputnik and um, started the last phase of his career, which was really making sense of it all and trying to, to memorialize himself as much as possible. Uh, Corey Hay took him to Studio 54, and, and this is a photograph by Anton Parrish of around that time. Uh, he showed up at the opening of Studio 54 in, in a hat like that, a purple hat, and he made uh, the front page of the post. <laughs> Um, and this is, this is one of his last designs in the late 70s. Uh, the top is, he invented the sports bra for Mary Ellen Hecht, who, who was a department store heiress and Gertrude Stein's niece. Um, so that's a modification of, of the sports bra. And on the bottom, he was experimenting with pants that both men and women could wear. He, he loved experimenting with transgender clothes. He was very ahead of his time there. So that's a modification of pants he made for Stephen Tennant, who is Stella Tennant's uncle uh, in the 1930s. Yeah. Okay. So we'll leave it on here for the last one. And we have a couple of questions which have come from the audience. OK. So. Um, Oh, well, the first one you have kind of answered, the movie Phantom Thread. 
is the main character based on Charles James? No, no the, the visuals are, ba are based on Charles James. The, the first dress that you see in the movie is a dress called the tulip dress. That's a line for line copy of a Charles James. Um, but, but the story has nothing to do with Charles James's life. What was the most surprising piece of research you encountered? What? The most surprising information you encountered in the course of your research? Well, what surprised me most about Charles James was I ended up really, really liking him and admiring him and thinking he was a great <laughs> human being because he has such a terrible reputation. I didn't think I would, but I, I think he was a wonderful man. Yes, I think Very. that's extraordinary. People yeah. who loved him really did love him. Really although, loved him. Yeah. Although God knows he could be impossible. My favorite quote is one of the people who worked for him said they call this a maison de... Uh, couture, but it's a maison de torture. It's a torture house. <laughs> because he was so persnickety and he'd, he, he'd have uh, temper tantrums. <laughs> um, which contemporary designers do you think are most influenced by Charles James? Okay, well, Halston is not a contemporary designer, but Halston was totally influenced by Charles James, so we'll start there. Yes. Um, who do you think? Talk about Halston first, because uh, well, we so, need to get so the Halston story out. So he met out. Halston in 1958 in, in uh, Chicago when his life was falling apart and Halston's life was coming together and Halston was making hats. And uh, Halston immediately saw that Charles was super cool, super chic, super everything. And, and Halston was very good looking and very good at, at charming people. And Charles took him under his wing and introduced him to Lily Dache. And that was the beginning of Halston's ascent. When they both came to New York, they'd have dinner at least once a week, and Halston just modeled himself after Charles James. You know, Charles James drank Don Perignon. Don Perignon was the only thing Halston drank. You know, Charles James liked white orchids. White orchids were Halston's signature bloom. You know, everything, and Halston, uh, th somebody wrote a, a biography of, of a, I interviewed somebody who wrote a biography of Halston, and he said, and he'd worked for both Charles and Halston, and he said the first time he got fired by Halston, and you really hadn't worked for Halston until he fired you, <laughs> Halston gave him a lecture on clothing and fashion, and he was sitting there and he, he was going, you know, this is word for word Charles James. And he wanted to write the book on how Halston was really in direct line with Charles James, so his publishers didn't think that would be a good idea, so he wrote another book. But um, in, in 1969, uh, Halston decided, and Halston by 1969 had won a code 80, so he was really well known, and he decided he wanted to link himself even more with Charles James, so he gave a sort of a benefit at the Electric Circus, which was the nightclub du jour of, of that year, um, which was a Charles James fashion retrospective, and he had every famous, you know, Verushka, Angelica Houston, all the famous fashion models modeled in it, and it was a huge success. It, it was to benefit Parsons, actually. Um, it was to benefit Par Parsons Architecture School, not fashion school because Charles James considered himself an architect. Um, after that, Halston thought he would go one better and, and get ha Charles to work with him, and so in 1970, they did a collection together, and Charles really corrected a lot of Halston's faults. And Bernadine Morris gave it a full-page review in the New York Times, at which point Halston dumped Charles because he now, was, he now considered himself on a level with Charles. Um, and offered him $250 a week to not design, and Charles wouldn't take it, <laughs> which was not a small sum of money in, in 1970. I mean, it wasn't huge, but it wasn't, it, he could have lived on it. And Charles said, no, I wouldn't take it because I knew he was gonna just rip off my clothes, so Halston just ripped off the clothes and didn't pay him. And Charles became obsessed, and, 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 and it ended badly, and Charles drew a picture of a cockroach and called it Halston. <laughs> And now, because we do want to have some time, people want to have their books signed by Michelle. Okay. There's one last question, which is a perfect last question, thank you, called, what is your next project? Oh, Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> it's about art, not fashion. <laughs> All right, yeah. any more clues or that it? It's about women artists. It's, it's, a, it's a triple biography of three women artists uh, from the, 
uh, 70s to 2000, who had similar art and a similar trajectory and interesting um, lives. I, I don't, I don't want to elaborate further than that. Um, right. When I'm done with it, I hope you all read it. <laughs> all right, please join me in thanking Michelle. Now, I, th I think, is the idea to sign here or up there? Which would you prefer? <laughs>